Ain't no modern love gonna set me free like the kind of love that you give to me. I'm coming home to be with you. I'm coming home to be with you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Songbirds Radio Hour. I'm your host, Reed Caldwell, and tonight we are psyched to have the one and only Mason Jennings on the show. He played Songbirds back in November of 2023, and I was fortunate enough to sit down and catch up with him backstage. We chatted about him dropping out of high school to become a self-produced solo artist. We talked about the Beatles, and even a little bit about the animated film Shrek. As always, we're going to share that conversation alongside a playlist of Mason's live concert at Songbirds, some of his influences, and a handful of tracks from his mini albums. So, let's get right into it. We're backstage with Mason Jennings before his show on November the 17th here at Songbirds. So happy to have you with us. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule to join us and on the on this fun day here in Chattanooga. First time in Chattanooga. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. What a beautiful building and such cool guitars in here. Yeah, we've got a few guitars just around, you know, some knock arounds. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. One of those you want to leave like laying against your bed, you know. <laughs> What's funny, we always talk about this, we joke about this all the time with these guitars are these these valuable things, but you know that you know that like uh, you know, Dwayne Allman and those guys, they probably just threw that guitar around all over the floor. Oh yeah, totally. Just laid it on <laughs> just laid it down by the couch. Someone probably stepped on it, dropped yep. a cigarette on it, you know, no one cared. Right. And then now you're like, wow, that's a super valuable thing. Uh, that's really amazing piece of history. But uh, I mean, this you got Marky Moon right here. This is uh, Richard Lloyd's guitar. He wrote Marky Moon on that guitar. Cool. He he lives here in Chattanooga. Wow, cool. He's actually got a show coming up in like what two weeks here, three weeks. Anyway, Chattanooga so. seems cool. I can't believe I haven't been here before. It's a cool town, man. It's uh, it's come a long way in the last like forty years. It was kind of I remember when, as when I was a kid, we'd travel up this way, and I mean, it just this part of the city that we're in is South Side, and from the interstate, it just looked like a burned out husk of a city. You know, yeah. it was just kind of like everything was falling down, and we we'd gas up on the far side and drive straight through, and we just like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like it's, it's funny because you told my, my myself, my younger self in the eighties that you would, I would live here. I'd be like, no way. No way, but it's <laughs> it's uh it's such a great place, man. Such a lot of a lot of good music. Music's great. We got a lot of great music history here. We had the Big Nine, and uh, which is just you know a lot of famous people came out of here. Like uh, James Brown played a show at the Memorial. Walked over to the Big Nine, which is the old historic district for music, and uh, picked up Clyde Stubblefield. Whoa! Just like they he just joined the house band, played a song. He's like, "You're in my band." Whoa! Yeah, right down there. Clyde Clyde's from here. Cool. And the impressions and yeah. Got a great history and it's starting to go go some places too now. It's just it's awesome. Um, let's talk a little bit about your history. So you were telling me earlier that you're from Minnesota originally. Uh talk a little bit about, you know, when you started you, you know, getting started playing guitar, uh when you were pretty young, you dropped out of school to pursue music. Talk a little bit about that. Just kind of get us get us started here. Well, I actually grew up in Pittsburgh, but I moved to Minnesota as a teenager. So I started, you know. I was probably like 14. I was just a guitar. I just loved it, you know, like, I, and I was a hair metal kid, you know, so I grew up, you know, loving Motley Crue and my first concert was Cinderella. So like I had a pink guitar, loved to shred. That's how I got it. And then slowly, like, I just started getting more interested in lyrics and things like that. So then my dad was always like, we got to get you an acoustic guitar so we can hear what you're saying. And I'm like, oh no, why would I ever want an acoustic guitar? And then eventually he got me an acoustic when I was probably, I don't know, 16 or 17. And then it just, it seemed to me that the, when I was playing the acoustic, people actually started listening to me more. So like, it kind of just gravitated towards that more. But I still play electric sometimes too, and it's been a long journey with that stuff. When you're recording and you, you put down a track, do, do you still have that tendency to be like, dude, I could put a thousand notes in here. I could just put a distortion pedal yeah. and like cheese it up. Yeah, and I, I have the, the uh, impulse to like make it more rock, but then I usually back off. Usually in the recording process, it gets more and more like edited down. But yeah, I still love that stuff. Do you have that guy that the, the that walks you off the ledge every time you're, you're, you're in the studio and he's like, no, dude, you, you can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's keep the vocals so we can hear them. 
let's uh let's con let's not have a hair metal solo right in the middle yeah, of this. Yeah. Let's concentrate more on on those those wonderful lyrics that you have. <laughs> uh yeah. So um so uh you did you uh, you dropped out of high school and uh, you got you started playing and yeah that's that's a brave move i mean talk a little bit about that i mean that's like so that's a big thing to say i'm gonna i'm gonna pursue music at especially at that kind of age and yeah i think it was just you know like i came from a rough spot and had a weird home life and it, eventually it was just i was just so distracted i couldn't even concentrate on school so i think like starting at about sixth or seventh grade i just ba barely was able to concentrate but music was like a salvation to me because you know, I, I got, I was lucky enough to get one of those really early four tracks and um, be able to record at my house on cassettes. And I started learning all the different instruments. And then, you know, I'd come home from feeling terrible all day in school because I just didn't know what was even happening. And I, and I'd go home and I'd like write a song and then make all the parts and like record it. And then by the end of the day, I'd feel like, you know, okay, like I made something in this world. Like also, I always just felt like I was nowhere, you know, like I lived outside of Pittsburgh in the middle of just nowhere. And you know, wasn't doing too good. And then I just feel like, you know, by putting a, putting a song into the world, I felt like I was somewhere, you know? So it was kind of the idea of just create a song as much as like every day, if I can. And, and music just became, you know, what I did all the time. And then I was like, you know, if you're really going to go for it, you probably should just dive in full out without a safety net. Cause if I had a safety net, like, you know, if I, if I gone to community college or something, I don't know if I would have just like thrown myself into the touring or the, the full on, uh, the hard the hard road of it because it was, was really a lot of work for the first like well it's always been a lot of work but the first ten years were really like being in a lot of debt traveling constantly like playing to nobody trying to find my voice that would be unique enough you know artistic voice that'd be different enough than everybody else that that it would find its niche in this world and give give back in my own way so yeah it just I mean it was stressful but but I'm I'm glad about it. I mean I. In, in hindsight, I wish I would have had a better home life where I could have gone to college or done school. But in the situation I was in, I feel like young me made the best of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us in the in the growing up, you know, had a four track or something recording. You know. Yeah. Actually, John and I uh, were listening to some of my old four track stuff from high school the other day. Oh, it, cool. It was not good. It was not good. <laughs> was there I mean, anything good amazing. about it though? What's that? Was there anything you're I mean, there's a few things where you hear a riff and you're like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I yeah. like pull, I like resurrected some riffs. I was like, oh, I, this is a really fun little riff. I'm, this was cool. I, I don't think I understand why this thing worked at the time, but it, it's cool now. Uh, but, you know, for you to come out and, you know, do that on four track. And then, I mean, you self-produced your first album and that's got like, you know, that's a pretty iconic album. You recorded just on a little four track, which is, yeah. I mean, it's an awesome album. Um I mean, you, you put in a bunch of work, so you had this album, and people obviously identify with that album. So I guess that helped you a bit with the kind of the struggle over 10 years, but you're still working super hard at the time. Yeah, because there wasn't an internet. It was, it was 98 when that... So that that first album I made, it was only supposed to be like a, just a, just an example of my work. I wasn't even trying to sell it or anything. I just thought of it as like a demo. Make yourself at home, I'm going out across the street to get us some water. And then I sent it to a bunch of record labels and they all rejected me. And I was like, oh man, but then I was like, maybe I'll just put them on a CD, you know? So I, I made like, when CDs were kind of early still, 
you know, I pressed a bunch of them and then they just sold out like right away. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe this will just, then I sold like over a hundred thousand of them out of my, out of my van, you know? And I was like, whoa, this is working out, you know? And, um, yeah, I just tour around and play the show, sell CDs, press some more CDs, tour around. And I just, from Minnesota, I would just tour out bigger and bigger circles outwards and start hitting the coasts. And, you know, we played like three people and just at every time I would played to three people, I'm like, let's make it six next time. Let's double it every time I come back. And that's what happened. It just doubled and it just kept growing. And it's, it's been good. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was a, it was sort of a road. I, I always wanted to get signed by somebody like Sire or, or uh, you know, it's one of these labels I loved growing up, but it ended up just being better when I did it myself. And I eventually did get signed, but it took a bunch of years. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of the, a lot of the great out al you know albums that you love, they started out that way, and you have a lot of leverage with a with a, or more re leverage at a, with a record company if you've already sold yeah hundred thousand copies yeah. of an album. You're you're kind of like, well, I don't really need you. I put you in a, really, a better place, I guess, when you start negotiating. And stuff. Totally, and they let me just do my thing, and it was much better than originally when I was. You know, I didn't want to have to change what I did because. I feel like my stuff is a little eccentric and like it's its own thing. So it's nice to have creative control. Look at me now. I'm all dressed up in your words today. Do you think about me? Do you think about me? And if it comes down, it's still about the sweet little things you say. After all that I've run from, where the f did you come from? Butterfly, baby, I still have my doubts about you, cuz. Butterfly, cuz I can't find nothing bad about you, and. Butterfly, you mess me up, you make my heart double beat, and. Butterfly, I don't know how it is you got inside of me, and. But you're in there now, oh you're in there now, you're in there now You made me yours, with your lovely cures Life is life, I don't know why it is I do things like this After all that I've come from, you're the woman I should run from Butterfly, baby I still have my doubts about you cause Butterfly, cause I can't find nothing bad about you eh? Butterfly, you mess me up, you make my heart double beat eh? I don't know how it is you got inside of me Songbirds Radio Hour If you're just joining us, our guest tonight is Mason Jennings That was his song Butterfly off his 1998 self-titled album Here's some more of our backstage interview so how did how did this how did music and tr and touring and stuff help you kind of cope with you were talking about some of your early childhood trauma and stuff like that if you want to talk about it we'd love to hear it if not you don't have to answer that but if you want to talk a little bit about how how it may have helped you work through some things I think that's pretty cool and powerful to talk about yeah I think um just you know because I've heard you guys give guitars to kids right yeah, yeah. I mean I, I saw that I was amazing because that's for me like getting that guitar in my hands um. You know, one of the things is just the tone against my body, you know, like coming from a place where there's a lot of dysfunction and there's a lot of like, you know, my parents came from trauma, their parents came from trauma. Like, so it was like a lot of really kind of messed up people and having that guitar against my body and then being able to like, um, create and like get in touch with something that's like, to me, it's like the creative spirit, I guess, because I didn't come from like a religious background or anything. And. And, but, but feeling that creative spirit move through me just was so comforting. And then I would always, I feel like when I look back at my old songs, I'm like, why am I singing all these love songs when I didn't come from, you know, like it wasn't like I had like super loving dynamic going on. Like, I'm like, why am I writing all these love songs? I think I was just singing to myself or like, or, or having something come through me and sing to me. So like this idea of like, I wanted to he hear about love and I wanted to feel like there was true love or I feel like there's a, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Unconditional love matters. So that was something I, I would like sing a lot about that with un unconscious or subconsciously. Then also s singing about like that I matter, you know, that people matter, that relationships matter. And I, I think like it just was a subconscious way to like tonally get that into my spirit, you know, like, like it's almost like nourishment. Like I was almost like cooking the spiritual food I needed to get through these really hard years. And Looking back, I'm like, wow, what a gift, because I could have easily just gone into like serious drugs 
And because that's where I think a lot of people get into drugs for just for the, same, for the same kind of reason, which is like to feel loved, I guess, or feel touch touch the infinite, I guess. And so like music is such a creative way to do that. Um, yeah, and a lot of people I was around at that time didn't didn't do so good, you know. So um, I just felt like it was always this this central comfort. And so when I saw that you were giving guitars away, I, I just feel like that was such a big deal for me to have a guitar, you know. And and my dad was cool because he would he would rent stuff from me sometimes. He's like, if you want to try any instruments, because he didn't live with me, but then I would. You know, he lived in a different state, but sometimes he would be like, yeah, well, if you want to try something, I'll rent it for you. So I tried a bass or I tried some drums and and then we got like a cheap, you know, I, I was got good enough. I got a cheap drum kit, you know, stuff like that. And I just I just loved it. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's like in hindsight, I, it's really it's painful to think about. But it's also because I feel for that for me as a teenager. I'm like, oh, man, dude, that sucks. He had to go through that. But at the same time, the music really was what a lifeline. And it's so cool to think of you got you guys helping kids out yeah i mean we we just we partner with gibson every year and uh ernie ball and we we buy about a thousand guitars and give them to schools wow. all over the place we, we're in nine states now and I, I don't i think we're teaching about you know, somewhere about ten thousand kids every year how to play That's guitar so awesome. we're at least giving them an opportunity yeah. to touch and hold a guitar yeah. and realize there's that outlet that tone you know that creative outlet's there it's a, a viable thing uh you can use it for therapy or whatever reason yeah. uh, just to make music or make noise just to make noise it's yeah. great and I, I think that opportunity is something that we're super proud of and it's what we focus most of our attention on here is really making sure that that's that kids have the, those outlets because it's great it's cool i think i think you kind of touched on a question that i had i was i was thinking a little bit about yeah i guess when i was first exposed to your music someone just handed me a burned disc and it just said mason jennings on it and i thought it was actually the first album that was just mason jennings but it actually was like a hodgepodge of like maybe three albums. Cool. And it had like, you know, California and a couple of those tunes on. The, the songs you're talking about earlier, they're mainly love songs or, or songs about your life. But it also had some political songs on it, like uh, uh, Dr. King, I think, was on there. And uh, what's the one? Um, uh, Imperialism in America. Yeah, American US, Village, US Global Empire. Yeah, that song. Yeah. And then when I later, I went back and listened and found there was two, two distinct albums. And one is what you're saying. It's like all about love and life. And then the second one is super political. Um, talk a little bit about the transition between those two albums and then how that second album really is very relevant today in our political system, I think. And uh, just talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I think like the first record I made on my own, I hadn't even played shows or anything. So I was just kind of in a really like, did it on a reel-to-reel -reel four track. And so I was 22, recorded it, and then then I got a band together after that and that record started like I was saying like it started taking off but but the band I was playing with sounded different I started seeing the world and I was trying to record a second album we tried recording it like I think two or three different times and it wasn't it was I was having trouble because I was coming out of like my home or my you know being by myself not playing in front of crowds not playing with a band then I had this band to work with I was in front of all these sold out shows so it was just kind of like I think it was just sort of like um can almost feel like a worldliness to it like I came into the world more and, and, and it's like a more of a collaborative album and then those those songs were um, I started reading like tons of tons of books I think that was just what it was and I was just reading lots of books and for me sometimes when I read I'll just put it right into a song or I'll, whatever's inspiring to me and so it's just at that time in my life that's what kind of happened and and yeah I mean when I hear that stuff now it does it does seem like topical for what's happening in the world but it was like 20 23 years ago that yeah. i did that now yeah some things i guess you had the the i guess that was right around the time of the bush election too i guess 2000 something like that after 9 11 it was yeah oh yeah it was right before 9 11. it was right yeah, before yeah come on media is the empire's mouth capitalist propaganda coming out Violence, all in the name of freedom. Freedom is not competition. I believe freedom's got to come from here. Yes, it does, not with gun. Freedom's the ability to feel love for everyone.
Songbirds Radio Hour. Tonight, we're chatting with Mason Jennings. We caught up with him backstage at Songbirds before his show in November 2023. You just heard his song, United States Global Empire, off his album, Birds Flying Away, which came out in 2000. We've got more interview and music coming right up. I think I always like to kind of ask a similar question of this. And you are, you know, you write great lyrics, and I'm sure you've got some inspiration from other people's lyrics. Maybe think about a lyric that it's kind of like one of those lyrics that you love and you also hate it because it's so damn good. You're just like, <laughs> you, you hear it and you're like, I'll never, I'll never make anything that good. Yeah. Maybe, maybe talk about some of those artists or if you remember a specific lyric of another tune, maybe I, I know that's kind of putting you on the spot to remember yeah. a lyric, but if you can think of something, I think it's uh, interesting. Well, I mean, right off the top of my head, John Lennon, you know, there's nothing you can do that can't be done. That from all you need is love. Everything and all you need is love. Like every line is, and he, he was just joking around. It was just like him just being like, you know, and I was just, uh, you know, nothing you can sing that can't be sung. All all this, nothing you can do but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. Just like John Lennon freaks me out. That's like a freaky. Uh, he's touched. Um, let me think about some. Of, there's a lot of Greg Brown lyrics that I love. I'm trying to think of off the top of my head that you know he him. And then there's just the people like like uh, well Dylan of course and. And Hank Williams, like Hank Williams is freaky because he just makes it sound so simple. You just think, is this even a song or is this just, just like a tree? You know, it's like, it just seems like it's always been there. Now you're looking at a man that's getting kind of mad. I had a lot to look, but it's all been bad. No matter how strong and strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. My fishing pole's broke, the creek is full of sand. My woman run away with another man. No matter how struggle and strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. Yeah, he does write some of those iconic songs that you're just you're kind of dumbfounded. You're like, this seems like such a simple thing to think of, but it's so amazing, and no one's done it like that again. Yeah, and so much of it's like, yeah. The singing too like he you just it's so on i think the beatles that's 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 great i mean john lynn i mean all, the, the beatles in general all of them, yeah. i mean i just watched uh, the the now and then yeah the little documentary it's like a 12-minute thing narrated by paul mccartney and even that song you're like yeah i mean it's not the best beatles song in the world but the thing that they're still coming up with these tunes and they, they it's just it's crazy man i mean and get back was amazing just oh. watching Watching that whole sequence of them, I guess I didn't, I never realized, I thought they, I knew they played on the rooftop, but I never really realized that those songs are the ones that are on the album. <laughs> yeah. Like I, in I, the cold I, and the wind. Yeah. They like, they recorded them up there live and sometimes they ran them twice, but that's, you know, that's like them on the roof playing live, just playing a song they wrote earlier that mind, day. And you're mind like, bending. one of the most, like some of the most iconic songs you, that everyone knows. Yeah. Right? Let it be the whole series, the whole scene in that movie when, when Paul's showing them, let it be. I was just crying the whole time. The whole it's something about it. it's just, you know that that was a really neat. Uh, when they were showing, they had the cameras on, and Paul was writing "Get Back," the song, because that he just kind of like got in a little hunch and he kind of got a groove going. And I'm like, that's that's how it works. I mean, I've written a lot of songs, and that's kind of what happens. You just start screwing around, and next thing you know, you're like, don't notice it, but you're like hunched over, and then two hours later, you're like singing the whole song. You know, and it's just, I was like, wow, somebody caught that on tape. It's like a, it's like catching the Bigfoot in the wild, you know. Jojo was a man who thought he was a loner, but he knew it couldn't last. Jojo lived his home in Tucson, Arizona, on some California grass. Get back, get back, get back to where you once belonged.
that and the restoration of it makes it feel like oh. it was shot like yesterday. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You're kind of like, well, I'm in the room with this guy writing this awesome tune. It's yeah. crazy. And he gets the lyrics a little, you're like, those are the wrong lyrics, man. Get them right, get them right. And yeah. he finally, he hones Don't in. Don't you know that iconic song? Come on, man. Yeah, come on, man. I also Cheers. like how it showed, like, it showed them on such an intimate level of like, I think it was really funny when like Linda McCartney comes in. Well, she's not McCartney at the time. Yeah. But, and and you can just see Paul just show, start showing off. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, totally. Starts all all his like big starts all he sits down on the piano and he's like, oh, like, we just wrote this song. He's like playing some of the biggest songs ever. Yeah. <laughs> just to like show off her going. He's like, dude, I don't think you have to show off your Beatle art. You know, like I. But it is, it does really give them like a human side. You're just kind of like you really identify with. And then you've just got Ringo over there who's like, he's just like, I farted. Yeah, he's just chilling. <laughs> Which just made me, they're all like arguing and he just doesn't want to argue, it seems like. It just keeps it level. Songbirds Radio Hour. Tonight's show is all about Mason Jennings, his music, and his influences. That, of course, was the Beatles' Get Back. Now we're going to get back into the interview. But first, I wanted to let you know that if you want a complete set list from this episode, you can find that on our website, songbirdsfoundation.org, or in the show notes on your favorite podcast app. Yeah, so... uh just talk a little about your guitar in general. I always like to kind of get a little nerdy on the guitar. I think it's cool that you that you came from a metal background. Yeah. I know a ton of players who come, a lot of them are bluegrass now. It seems like they like, I guess they blew their ears out early and now they're like, <laughs> I'll just settle for playing really fast. On yeah. But talk a little bit about, I mean, like there's there's a bunch, I feel like there's a, on that, on the album, there's a bunch of different, I wrote, I made some notes here. There's some like, some like, really big shimmery sounds on songs like uh, In Miracle uh, to like really dark. There's some heavy riffs and stuff like uh, Chemical Car and some other things like that. How do, how do you choose those and how do you know that these are to, these songs go together on an album? Well, it was an interesting album. Like, uh, so I, my wife and I had a baby last March. So it was sort of, I thought, I thought, didn't think I was gonna be writing anything, but you know, she would wake up with him in the night and then I would wake up with him at six in the morning and, and we live out on a lake in Minnesota and I would kind of hang with him from like six to nine and let her sleep. And then I thought maybe he'll like it if I play guitar for him. And I've always got two Martins. I love Martins. That's what I play. And I've got like a old 1952 little, like, yeah, <laughs> they're all a whole wall of them. <laughs> Just D45 right there. Free war. Sorry. I didn't, didn't. Yeah. I got this little, uh, 0017 from 1952. And then I also have a D28 that's probably from 2006 or something. So I got them sitting there and, um, and so I started playing guitar for this little baby and usually the babies hate it when I play guitar. I don't know why they usually just don't like it, but he loved it. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll just start making some stuff up. So I started making up songs. And then over the next few months when I wake up with them, I wrote like over 40 songs. And that was the biggest burst of songs I've ever, I mean, usually for a record over two years, I'll write 15. And then this was like three months of writing like 48 songs. So it's just kind of me sitting there and um, playing them. And then after that, like I'm, I'm on a label, it's Stone Gossard from talk about another great guitar player. He's uh, Pearl, Jam. Pearl Jam. Yeah. So his label is called Loose Groove and I'm on his label. And so I just sent him these tapes I was making and, you know, just me, a guitar and voice. And we whittled it down to 11 for the record. And then, and then from there, like just with, with his help, we had other musicians add stuff to it. So like the stuff that's shimmery um, got shimmery after the fact, it was really like, that might have just been me and a guitar, or me and a little piano, just the recording in my lake house, and then we added stuff after the fact. So it kind of, the, the production kind of made them all fit together more than, you know, uh, 
thematically or anything. Well, I guess it's the thematic. The theme through it is I wrote them all in the morning between six and nine over one summer with my little baby. The baby's cooing and all the demos and just like watching me. And so it has that kind of, that's sort of a, the, the tone that goes through it all. I think that's cool how albums come together like that, right? Yeah. You've got a ton of albums to kind of choose, you know, kind of as to, to think back through, but some of them are, you know, they're all, they all have the same tone, guitar tone. They all just like all acoustic, which is great. And then some of them are just like a kind of a, a hodgepodge of like a, you know, a really big guitar, really, and then like a really tight something, you know, and then like maybe a compressed something and then an acoustic guitar. And, but they, they, and, and they come together, like you're saying, like, oh, I just wrote all these in the summer. Or, and, I, and then I think some of them like, uh, are all just all political songs. And it's, 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 it's interesting to see how those albums come together like that. I think that's a really cool thing to think about that maybe the albums, I know there's like, it seems like you're taking 48 and cutting it down, but really maybe those tunes are meant to be together. They, they kind of pull themselves together. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's, that's when I usually, like I haven't written in a year now and it usually like, you want, when you start writing, for me, when I start writing again, it's usually like something has to happen in my life to make it feel like the last album ended and we're starting something fresh, you know? Yeah. That's kind of the, and it can happen in a short period of time or a long period of time. It's just that you don't want to like just continue the last record with the new record. You want, you want it to feel like something, something's new. Like for this, for the guitar, like for this last record, for some, whatever reason, I've tuned my guitars to E flat. Like I tune them flat for, since I was a teenager. I don't know, I think it was like, I think, uh, Jimi Hendrix or somebody, Weezer, maybe some Rage Against the Machine. Oh, that's what like it was. Slash. Does Sla it, yeah, uh, Guns tunes it flat. Tunes. Okay, this, so that's maybe I was. That's probably what it is then. Because I'm like probably somewhere like along the way. Sweet child, child yeah, solo, learning that. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta turn this thing down to E flat because I can't play it with the record. I'm, that's, oh, that's, that's good to know. Out. Okay, good. So Slash. Somebody's responsible. So, anyways, I tune them flat. But then for this record, I was like, what if I put a capo on the second fret? And I was watching like Gordon Lightfoot who I'd never really heard until this last summer too. I started listening to some of his stuff was great. And like, so I put a capo on the second fret. So it's in this weird, like, that's where all these songs were written with tuned flat, but a capo on the second, f second fret. So it's kind of stranger keys that I'm used to using. So you got a good, what's a, a Gordon Lightfoot. All I can think of is record the Edmonds Fitzgerald. But I know he's got a, we got like a go-to album you're listening to there. Well, he did that one three and it's a little less produced and it's, there's a song called only love would know. It's awesome guitar and and vocals. Does the light of fashion still burn bright? Only love would know my imagination. Tells me I'm a pet-up fool in the deep end of the pool. Is the light of She lives on the other side, I want to know the reason why She arrives at promises and you believe in what she says Everywhere you go And then also like he, he just, his last record before he died was called Solo, so it's just him and a guitar and he found it. It's like an old record. Like it was like recorded. Somebody found it and was like, hey, there's this record of just you and a guitar. And do you want to put it out? And he's like, yeah, let's put it out. Because his voice, when he got really old, he had some something wrong with his voice. So this is like the last, uh, the last little cool record. It's called Gordon Lightfoot's Solo. And it's there's a song called Oh So Sweet. Another one called Return Into Dust. Great guitar songs and just a guy and a guitar. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I'm not, I'm not, aware, I wasn't aware of that album, but. I do like Gordon Lightfoot, yeah. from, especially from nostalgia from childhood. Yeah, it's a vibe. Lots of lots of records being played uh, in our house when I was a kid. I, I was just thinking all the, all the way through there, all the E flat players as well. Like, uh, what do you got? Stevie Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, okay, e that's yeah. it. So that's Flash. what it was. It was guitar. It was the guitar magazines when I was younger. Yeah, I probably just tuned it flat and just liked it better. Yeah, a bunch of those guys. Raging Against the Machine, right? Yeah, it, well, he he would do some alter. Yeah, yeah, I think they would drop down sometimes, maybe like into like parade. open C or open D or even I don't know. They, yeah, they they got a lot of drop tunes. Molly Crew has dropped down to D a lot. Oh yeah, full stuff like Doctor Feelgood. Oh yeah, yeah, he was, was such a that was such a heavy intro. I remember the first time I heard Doctor Feelgood, I was at my friend's house and he was showing me his Nintendo and he put on. Uh, 
put on Dr. Feelgood, and I just couldn't even, I, I was so into the Nintendo, but then that, just that heavy <laughs> yeah, intro comes intro. on, and I'm like, what is that? I want amazing. that. I it's, want that. You still know? sounds incredible to me. Oh, I know. It's just such a, uh, it's such a huge album. That, All right, uh, we got a couple of little things just to button up. Uh, we, I got a couple of questions from people from that people submitted for me to ask. One, one of them's, one of them's talking about talking about your phrasing and stuff. People have compared you to Bob Dylan, and I just kind of wanted to know, like, uh, what, what is it? You know, do you like the comparisons of those kind of things? I mean, it is Bob Dylan, but what do you think about that when people say well, stuff like that? It was cool because I didn't really hear Bob Dylan, which you, you think I'm lying, but I didn't hear him until I was probably 20. So it's just, it, it's more like when I was in my teens, I became obsessed with, well, I was like a metal kid. And then I like fell in love with the movie Crossroads, which was like Steve Vai. Then it took me back to Robert Johnson, the, the, who the movie's about. And then I started buying through the mail, like tons of blues and folk records through like Yazoo and all these things. So I started like, I think my, my phrasing and the stuff comes from more people like Lead Belly or like Mississippi John Hurt. And I think that that's maybe what people are hearing more. And then growing up in Pittsburgh, I have like a weird Pittsburgh accent. So they're kind of hearing like, and then I'm, it's illiterate, you know, like I really like stories and stuff. So I think that, you know, and then later I like Dylan, but when I hear Dylan, yeah, for, for me, Dylan, I mean, I'm just, when I finally got into him, I like, I loved it so much, you know, and I love Blood on the Tracks, but it was more like not really an early influence, but I, I, it was cool. I was a part of that movie about Dylan, the I'm Not There movie where a bunch of people played Bob Dylan, like Kate Blanchett played him, Heath Ledger, and then I did uh, Christian Bale's vocals for that. So we did like the early Dylan stuff and then they had me sing some songs, which is kind of fun, so. It's cool, I don't know, I mean, I mean, I'm a huge fan of his music, but it wasn't like an early influence or anything. Well, I think, you know, you're talking about those old blues records. I mean, that's where Dylan got his phrasing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, <laughs> I mean, I'm like, we're copying the same I mean, people, it's like, you know? Brent, you're, you're all coming, going back to the original source material, yeah. rather than just like saying it's from Bob Dylan, which is, you know, he, he did the same thing. Um, I, I kind of, you know, that's how I got into blues too. I heard one thing on the radio and I just kind of went down this rabbit hole in Mississippi and just found all these random things. And it, you know, it really, it, it, I can hear it in my playing now. I'll try to learn something and I, it's really hard because I, I, I learned that back beat kind of bluesy thing. And it's really hard to break out of it. I, like, especially the stuff you learn when you're super young. But I think, uh, you know, looking at your phrasing and stuff like that, I think it, it's interesting because most people cannot find a unique sound or don't or aren't able to or whatever but like your sound is super distinct whenever you hear a song you're like that's mason jennings and i think that's great i think that's a, it's a cool thing it's something that sounds like it comes pretty natural to you i mean maybe it maybe it's something you worked on forever but it's like it wasn't on purpose but yeah it's very distinct thanks i mean that was that was what i said i mean the whole for me is like try to get it as simple as possible but recognizable mm -hmm. you know and that's when we're talking about like john lennon or something like to me, that's just, that's the goal is like, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I was talking to some friends of mine that were like mountain climbers and they were, they were talking about these, the stuff they use to take up the mountain. They're like, we want to hold the most weight with like the least amount of like pieces, you know? So like they use these like little hooks and stuff and they're like, and I was like, that's what I do with songs. Like, I'm like, how can I hold the most weight with the least amount of little pieces, you know? And, and, um. I think so. for me, when I was a teenager, I would sing more like emphatically, like I was definitely more like the Eddie Vedder world or like just singing more like, a, you know, more like a rock singer. And then slowly I just kept being more and more drawn to more conversational with like little hints of the emphatic. And to me, it's about communication and tone. And like, for me, like I, the older I get, the more I'm into like the comfort of like the, the connection between a voice and like, how can the voice be a connecting tone? Um, yeah, it's just a natural it's just a natural evolution i think it's and my plant my guitar playing too you know like when we're talking about blues i liked i liked like steve ray vaughn and i really liked like hendrix and i love jimmy page but with my voice i ended it ended up being more interested in like the the finger style um like mississippi john hurt kind of playing that's really gentle and like kind of mo more melodic it's less like blues scales it's more like I don't know, folk or major chords. And uh, 
that kind of goes good with my voice. And, and it also doesn't, I, then I don't sound like I'm singing some, culturally, I'm not singing something that's out of my culture. It's like I'm singing in my culture about things that are happening in my life conversationally, but then there's like a nice bed I can put under it that, you know, has a bunch of different roots to it. Yeah. I like the analogy of, of the climbing gear, you know, you know, the smallest thing that carry the most weight. I don't think many people look at music like that anymore. I mean, no. I'm sure there are people out there, but it's like, you have so many options at this point. Like you go in our studio across the street, and you're like, how many how many tracks can I put down? I mean, cause it used to be like, oh, you had this limiting thing. I can put down eight tracks. I can put down 16 tracks, 24. Now it's like, I can put down 2000 tracks and you know, they're just, it's infinite. And I think that people that can look at it like, I want something simple, but something that carries weight. I think that's a, re that's a really cool way to kind of look at music. Really yeah, cool. I mean, and that's, you're right. I think that's kind of harder and harder and harder. Like, and I think that's why when I, I keep touring around the country and I, I, I just bring a guitar and sometimes a little piano and, or a keyboard and it's just me usually. And, and that's, I think people still are interested in you know, Like some people are still interested in that art of like, I'll just get up there. There's no effects. There's no, you know, backing tracks or anything. And it's just going to be different every night in the way that just the least possible amount of pieces to the music. And, and I think that it's kind of, in some ways, it's the closest can, you can just, it's a heart to heart, you know, there's, there's nothing really in between the artist and the crowd that way. So yeah. I like it. As we mentioned at the top of the show, this interview took place back in November, 2023, right before Mason's concert at Songbirds. We're thrilled to be able to share just a few songs from that show. And as a quick side note, the new Songbirds location at 206 West Main Street, that's across from Feed and just down the block from Clyde's, is getting closer and closer to being open. We have a couple of preview events coming up this month if you'd like to catch a sneak peek. We've got the Tennessee Songwriters Week Showcase on February 20th and Leroy Parnell coming up on February 22nd. Come check us out. Here's Mason Jennings playing The Light Part 2 live at Songbirds. Good evening. Thanks for coming, what a beautiful place. And regardless, in the evening, a light is thrown by the setting sun speeds along this vast familiar and silently crosses everyone it's the light that's changing it's the light that's changing it's the light that's changing it's only the light Across the schoolyards, across the gardens, across the chapels where lovers have left, across the table in our old kitchen, across the cities where our future slept. It's the light that's changing. It's the light that's changing. It's the light that's changing It's only the light What can I do to defy you? Oh, what can I do to deny you? Cause I want no part of this breaking This is a hurtful mistake you are making to me this love was true and shining Oh, these years were real and defining Please, please don't forget how much I meant to you When, when you are redefined by someone new The cross was left of these old places Across the playgrounds where old friends play Across the lines on familiar faces 
Cross the nothing that we say It's the light that's breaking It's the light that's breaking It's the light that's breaking It's only the light Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I think this is my first time in Chattanooga ever. Can you believe it? After 30 years of touring, sorry about that. <laughs> it's bigger than I expected. I thought it was just going to be like, you know, a tiny little town, but it's actually really cool. I grew up in Pittsburgh. It kind of reminds me of the hills of Pittsburgh a little bit. I woke up before you in the total darkness early morning i could hear the wind in the trees and i was looking for the light to bring you out from the shadows redefine you now for oh, only me and honey i'm sure that you've been in love before and plenty of men have held high places in your eyes. Jealousy has got no use for me. The past is beautiful like the darkness between the fireflies. And I was driving fast up through the Appalachians. I could see the world go out below me in the sun hey. You should know by now Someone's always been there 
long before you You're never gonna be the only one And honey, I'm sure That you've been in love before And plenty of men have held high places in your eyes Jealousy has got no use for me the past is beautiful like the darkness between the fireflies beautiful like the darkness between the fireflies
Songbirds Radio Hour. Our guest this evening is Mason Jennings, and that was Cursive Prayers from his show here at Songbirds. Let's jump right back into the interview. Cool. I got one. I got a question from an audience here. They they wanted to know, like, you wrote a song. You talked about movies earlier. You wrote a song for Shrek, right? And then, but then it didn't get on the, didn't get make it on the in the movie. Well, how was? What's yeah, I get asked all the time. I mean, that, I've probably done that ten different times for movies. They'll say, "Do you want to write this?" And then oftentimes I'll write it, and then they'll say, "Oh, you know, it didn't fit or whatever." Counting Crows got the song or something, or somebody else. And so then I just have to ask myself, like, is this just specifically about the movie, or can I still use it? You know, so so with that, the song they're talking about is called "Keeping It Real," and it's on my, it's on "Use Your Voice," and I, it doesn't have anything about Shrek in it, but it's just, it's sort of like a. You know, there's stuff like it's a big fat love we feel in our hearts. There's just like little things where you can tell it's about like uh, the earth shakes when you walk by, stuff like that. There's stuff that's about ogres, but you never know. I mean, and like, and probably like once a month, I get somebody's like, that's our wedding song. And I'm like, that's the ogre, in, inner <laughs> ogre. <laughs> I walk down the aisle to that song. Oh, well, I, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. The earth shakes when you walk by, it's a fairy tale that we made true. I can't believe that I found you and it's oh yes, my oh my. People turn and look when we walk by. It's a big fat love we feel in our hearts. We're keeping it, keeping it, keeping it real. Now the sun is going down. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Mason, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule before your show to, to talk to us. Um, you got anything to kind of leave us with on maybe like what you're doing now and current stuff, what you're working on? Yeah, I'm just working on a new a new record. I actually found a bunch of the older. You were asking what I did after my first record between the sec, first and second, and I might have found some old recordings. Maybe we'll try to get those out one of these days. And, and also I've been working on some cover songs for maybe a new record, which maybe is going to have to do with the 80, my 80s roots. So some stuff cooking. We're not sure yet, but fun stuff in the works. 80s roots i'm i'm in i'm in i'm in <laughs> i'm especially if it's like you got you got a combination of the songs between the two albums that i like gr grew up listening to and 80s stuff I can't go wrong you got to cover dr feelgood though i tried that one i got a couple other motley crews i'm working on that one's a little hard because some of them are just they're built for the electric guitar and some of them like like home sweet home you can kind of can turn into an acoustic song a little easier yeah but I, I do think I do think an acoustic Doctor Phil. Yeah, yeah. You could pull it off. I'll, okay. It would be unique. It would cool. be like a thing where you'd hear it and you'd be like, you. It would start out and you're like, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's the goal. Some, some some of those some of those classics done through my filter. Huh? Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being with us yeah. on the Songbridge Radio Hour. Thank you. you walk by, it's a fairy tale that we made true. I can't believe. That I found you and it's oh yes, my oh my. People turn and look when we walk by. It's a big fat love we feel in our hearts. We're keeping it, keeping it, keeping it real. Songbirds Radio Hour was made possible through a grant from the Riverview Foundation. This episode was produced and written by Reed Caldwell and John Dooley. Live recording by James Snyder. Additional thanks to Victoria Sauer, WTC, and of course, Mason Jennings. Directed and edited and mixed by John Dooley. A list of the music used in this episode is available in the show notes on our website or in your favorite podcast app. If you'd like to see a show at Songbirds, please visit songbirdsfoundation.org to check out our event schedule. We've got a couple of preview events in our new 206 West Main Street location coming up this month, so... Be sure to check out the website for more details. Tickets will go fast.